Little six-year-old Natalino didn't like these meetings too much. While his father was ill, his mother Barbara was secretly dating a bricklayer named Antonio. Although Natalino was small, he understood that a child should not be taken to such meetings. On one warm August night in 1968, Natalino was present at another one of his mother's secret meetups, where she got into the car with her lover. In an effort to not hear their conversations, the boy stretched out in the back seat and fell asleep. Natalino only wanted to open his eyes after they had returned home again. However, the boy was forced to wake up a bit earlier than that. Loud shots rang out near his window. When Natalino woke up, he saw the dead bodies of his mother and her lover. Turning his head, the frightened boy noticed a hand clutching a still-smoking pistol. The killer reached for Natalino. He pressed himself against the back seat and closed his eyes tightly, hoping that the killer would disappear. The offender grabbed the child and threw him lightly over his shoulder. Natalino trembled with fear and was afraid to make the slightest sound. Tears ran down his cheeks. The terrible killer suddenly began to sing a popular song to the boy. This made the boy even more frightened. What could one possibly expect from a man who just shot two people and is now singing like nothing happened? The car was parked on the outskirts of a small town near Florence. The killer entered the nearest street. He left Natalino near the closest house and disappeared into the night. The barefoot boy knocked on the door and asked to be taken home, as his mother and another man lay dead in the car. The suspicions of the police first fell on Natalino's father, Stefano Mele. It was a logical conclusion, since the cold-blooded killer would not need to leave a witness alive. Only this witness being not the son of the killer, but of the victim, who is his wife caught with her lover. A paraffin test for the presence of powder particles showed that Stefano had indeed shot a firearm recently. This forced the now widower to confess to being at the scene of the crime. Stefano also said that another lover of his wife, Salvatore Vinci, was with him. However, the widower later dropped all charges against Salvatore, and he himself received 14 years in prison. At that time, murder usually called for longer sentences, but Stefano's term was reduced due to his mental instability. Six years later, it became clear that the police were most likely wrong about the case. While Stefano was still in prison, there were several more similar reprisals against couples. It became obvious that the killer was still at large. It was September 15, 1974. 19-year-old Pasquale Gentocore had just finished his shift at the bar where he worked as a bartender. He jumped into his Fiat and raced off to his beloved 18-year-old Stefania Patini. They had planned to spend that evening at a local disco called Teen Club. However, on the way there, the lovers decided to stop on a country road to be alone for a while. It was a fatal mistake. Just as they were getting intimate, they were shot right there in the car. Then, the killer cut Stephanie's body with a vine and a knife. He had stabbed her 97 times in total. Later, a close friend of Stephanie's reported one day that someone was following them during a driving lesson. A few hours before her death, the girl complained to another friend that she was being frightened by a very suspicious man. Some people also noted that people who liked spying on couples in love would often appear in that area, among which there were very creepy individuals. However, for investigative purposes, these testimonies turned out to be useless and the case came to a standstill. June 6, 1981. Young saleswoman Carmela Dinuccio was on cloud nine. A warehouse worker named Giovanni Foggi had recently proposed to her. During short breaks at work, they planned their wedding and dreamed of a future life. That evening, they pulled their car over on the side of the road, and by the morning the locals found their bodies. The girl's body was mutilated, as in the previous case. Moreover, the sophistication of the killer increased each time. Before the police found the bodies, a certain Enzo Spalletti told his wife about the murder. The man liked to secretly watch other couples and naturally became the prime suspect. Enzo spent three months in prison, but when the terrible murder happened again, he had to be released. Despite the obvious similarities, the police considered the murders unrelated for some time. Everything changed when journalist Mario Spezzi described the crimes. It was he who gave the maniac the name Monster of Florence. On October 22, 1981, the killer struck again. His victims were again engaged lovers, Stefano Baldi and Susanna Camby. A few days before her death, Susanna told her mother about a strange man who was chasing her in a car. The day after the murder, an anonymous person called the mother, wanting to talk about the murdered daughter. 
the police also spoke to two couples who had gotten a good look at the criminal. Witnesses described him as a slightly crazy man who traveled in a red Alfa Romeo. Thanks to these testimonies, it was possible to compile the first sketch of the Florentine monster, but the killer went silent for about a year. Mechanic Paolo Minardi and dressmaker Antonella Migliorini were called Vinival by all their friends and acquaintances, the reference being made after the famous brand of superglue. The lovers planned their wedding and spent every second of their time together. June 19, 1982, they stopped their car on the road leading to the village of Montespertoli. Rumors about the maniac terrified all of Italy, so the couple deliberately chose a rather busy spot, hoping that the killer would not risk attacking them. But they were terribly wrong. The lovers saw the killer before he even came close to them. The Florentine monster killed the bride with his first shot and severely wounded the groom with the second. Trying to compose himself as best he could, Paolo started the car and tried to leave, but lost control and drove into a ditch. The Florentine monster took no unnecessary risks and disappeared. Choosing a busy place didn't save the girl from death. When the police and the ambulance arrived at the scene of the crime, they found Paolo barely alive. Unlike other witnesses, he had definitely seen the killer clearly and would certainly have been able to identify him. With all necessary precautions, the wounded man was taken to the hospital, but the doctors could not help him, and he died a few hours later. Another year passed. Then, in the autumn of 1982, two fine arts teachers from Germany traveled over to Italy. Wilhelm Friedrich Horst Meyer had just been appointed to an important position and wanted to celebrate it with his friend, Jens Yui Rusch. They took a small minibus for the trip. While in it, they were shot on their way to the town of Galuzzo. This was possibly due to Rusch's small build and long blonde hair, and the killer may have mistook him for Meyer's girlfriend. Next to the corpses lay a torn, gay, pornographic magazine. Most likely the Florentine monster tore it apart in anger when he realized his mistake, but less than a year later this mistake was corrected. On July 29, 1984, student Claudio Stefanacci and his girlfriend Pia Gilda Rontini became the next victims of the maniac. Certain parts of the body were cut from the girl's body, as in most of the previous cases. Witnesses reported that a few hours before the murder, they saw a strange man in the bar where the girl worked. A friend of the victim also reported that she was bothered by this obnoxious creep type. A year later, the Florentine monster committed his last crime. In September of 1985, musician Jean-Michel Cravaville decided to leave France for a while together with his beloved, Nadine Mario. They chose the outskirts of Florence as a place for camping, not at all suspecting that they had fallen directly into the hands of the maniac. Jean-Michel was mortally wounded while trying to escape, and his beloved was killed and mutilated in their tent. Since the dead victims were foreigners, no one reported them missing. The killer decided to take advantage of this to mock law enforcement. He sent the prosecutor a fragment of the murdered girl's body, along with a note in which he said that a murder had occurred and demanded that the prosecutor find the victims. A few hours earlier, a local mushroom picker came across the torn tent. The Florentine monster was never found by the police, but it looks suspiciously like another famous killer. Who, more than anyone else, loved to lie in wait for couples in love who wanted to get away from the bustle of the city for a bit? That's right, the Zodiac the legendary madman from the US. The Italian media began to write about the connection between these bloodthirsty people in 2018. Journalist Francesco Amicone claimed that a certain Joseph Bevilacqua admitted that he is both the Zodiac Killer and the Florentine Monster. According to the journalist, Bevilacqua spoke about these moments from his biography in a personal conversation that took place in 2017. The man then subsequently denied his words and threatened the journalist with a lawsuit. However, Amicone continued to release more and more details. Bevilacqua was a longtime undercover agent in the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Department. In 1969 and 1970, he worked in San Francisco, in the area where the main crimes of the Zodiac had been committed. In 1974, the man moved to Florence, which coincides with the appearance of the Florentine monster. This theory has a slight flaw, though. The Italian maniac committed the first murder in 1968, although the journalist found an explanation for this, too. The murder of Antonio Lobianco and Barbara Locci in the presence of little Natalino were most likely two completely different people. Perhaps it was just the woman's lover, Salvatore Vinci, who was initially accused by Barbara's widower. 
Natalino himself had gotten confused many times in his testimony, mentioning Salvatore, then his father, then them together as murderers. In turn, Bevilacqua had access to these criminal cases, since he also worked as an army investigator in Florence. Wishing to prevent any suspicions regarding the connection between the Zodiac Killer and the Florentine monster, he simply replaced the original evidence of the shell casings from the pistol, from which he subsequently killed people. Additionally, the journalist claimed that the letters of the Zodiac encoded a word that was often encountered when describing the Florentine monster. The Italian police considered these arguments convincing and took Bevilacqua's DNA in 2020. However, the results of the study showed nothing, as did the analysis of the handwriting, which was completely different for the two maniacs. So did the serial killer manage to fool everyone yet again? Or is it just that some opportunistic journalist decided to cash in on old high-profile crimes, pinning them on an innocent person? Share your opinions on this in the comments below.